We're back for another exciting episode of The Spicy Life. I am your relationship expert and magnetic matchmaker, Spicy Madi. And on today's episode, I have a phenomenal guest in store for you, okay? We're doing Should Women Experience a Ho Phase? And to join in in the G spot, that's guest spotlight, um, Clifford, don't get nervous. <laughs> I have the wonderful and amazing Clifford J. Clark. He is a Christian preacher, licensed psychotherapist, and certified sexual addiction therapist candidate from IITAP, holding over 15 years of counseling experience. So he is an expert in his field that is able to discuss this hot topic with us. So crowd goes wild. Everybody welcome Clifford. <sighs> uh, <laughs> thank you for coming on the show, Clifford. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Spicy. I'm happy I can be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. So excited that I was able to get you in because I know you're in hot demand with all your clients. But you joined in on um, a clubhouse discussion that uh, we were having that was amazing. And I loved your perspective and your take on things. And I was like, I got to have this guy on the show. And that's when someone had asked the question of, um, my friends have said, you know, that uh, I need to go through a whole phase. Um, is this true, right? That was the question that was posed in Clubhouse. And I was like, this is the podcast episode. I need to have like a whole episode around this because I loved your take on it, but also want to share with the world on a larger level in, you know, is this phase necessary? Do we have to go through this phase as a rite of passage? But before we dive in, I have to ask you a spice breaker. Um, and this is where I get to open you up and ask you for a truth about yourself or your perspective on things. So you, you have to start off with telling us as listeners when you first fell in love with yourself. What was that moment? Uh, <laughs> when I first, first fell in love with myself. Yes. That's a great spice breaker. I, I like I liked the, uh, the, the tagging there. Um, when I first fell in love with myself, it probably had to be, oh man, I don't know. That's a great question. When did I first fall in love with myself? Um, I, think, I think it probably was around like 13, 12 or 13, when um, I was faced with a lot of adversity. I was, you know, born in the inner city of Detroit, you know, parents, uh, father had been murdered when I was 10 months old. And so I never okay. saw him. And, and then my mom was on drugs and alcohol. And so it was just like a broken family. And um, I became aware of what the statistics said. Young men like me who come from Detroit, uh, from that kind of background and profile, was uh, and how we ended up and so I think I really just kind of hunkered down introverted and really really started organizing my life to value myself and value um, to become the antithesis of what all the statistics were saying I was to become and that's when I really really got to know myself that's when I really, again, introverted and um, not in my personality, but just in my focus. Mm. And, and the rest was history. Um, I started really getting to know myself, started loving myself and started building my, my life uh, around my goals, which many of which I stand in realization of today. Give me some tips on the young gentlemen out there that maybe are at the beginning of their self-love journey. What are some things that you did to become more enlightened when it came to that process, right? Because we speak often to like how women can love themselves. Can you talk a little bit about what you did in order to fall back in love with yourself or to love yeah. yourself? Yeah, certainly, certainly, absolutely. Um, I think it first starts with um, identity. I'm mm. um, really um, asking God and discovering who it is you actually are. Um, you cannot love someone that you do not know. Yep. So I think the first step is to identify yourself in a world full of, um, you know, needles uh, in haystacks. You need to become the, <laughs> the, you need to learn which needle you are and which one you're not and yeah. how big is your, how, you know, thick is your needle and, you know, <laughs> yourself, you need to develop perspective about yourself. How sharp is your needle? Right. Um, right. And, and so I think it starts with self-actualization, mm -hmm. understanding your identity. And once you do that, then you can begin to, um, you can begin to understand and explore the value in yourself yeah. distinct from everybody else. But it really, it really, maybe, it's, maybe it starts practically with like a trial and error of trying things that you might think you like, yeah. and then discovering that you don't like those things and being honest with yourself and saying, okay, 
this this fits, this doesn't fit. Mm. And I think before you do that practically, you begin to kind of hone in and kind of concentrate, if you will, uh, an identity for yourself. Yeah. And we all have to go on that journey. We all have to go on that journey. So there's no circumventing that. But I think once you do that, uh, it, it's it's a good start. I love what you're speaking to too, because this is what I legit preach in my practice is that it starts with self. That's the S actually in spicy. A lot of people don't know that. And then what you spoke to secondly was like, what are your passions? What ignites you? What lights you on fire? Um, and you know, what are you, uh, what do you love to do? You know, what brings you joy? That's like the P in passion um, of spicy. And I always, I'm a huge advocate of that as well. So I love that you um, are acknowledging these things because those are like, my fundamentals when it comes to like what we need even to have healthy relationships with others, but it's also healthy relationships with self, right? How do you have a healthy relationship with yourself? So I love what you're, I love what you're saying. Um, we're going to yeah. get into the, the actual hot topic um, of today's episode is like, do we need to go through a whole phase? Um, and this is something that comes up oftentimes mostly focused on with women, you know, like, and I've even said before, like, I felt like my whole phase was a rite of passage because I learned so much about myself and, um, what I deem as sexual exploration, um, and being more open or fluid in who you allow, what partnerships you allow yourself to be in without the required commitment, which I now like preach. I'm like, nope, we don't do nothing without a commitment now. But going through my whole phase, um, clearly <laughs> I didn't demand that. I want to hear from you what you, how you articulate or what you think this whole phase is that we talk about right now in pop culture. Yeah, well, what I, how I understand it to be is essentially um, sexual promiscuity. Mm -hmm. It's a, a stage of being sexually promiscuous, um, sexually explorative. And um, it can it can be the case for many different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody goes on that journey for the same reason. Um, some of those reasons might include, but be not limited to um, trying to find yourself, yeah. trying to um, trying to maybe fill a void. Maybe there's a void there that you you want or need to be filled. And maybe you you, for whatever reason, through pop culture or other societal influences, you feel like um, that's the that's the avenue that you need to go. Um, perhaps there is uh, maybe there's peer pressure in a so a, a small microcosm of uh, influence of friends where you, you're getting counsel from girlfriends, boy, you know, homeboys that mm -hmm. are telling you. By the way, I don't just relegate this phase to just women. Good. Um, it's something that men men experience as well. Um, in fact, uh, you know, generally speaking, men probably experience it more. Uh -huh. uh, it's just, talk about just that. <laughs> social, social dynamics around that, but we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. Um, but, um, but I think it, you know, it, it can be explored and experienced for many different reasons. Um, again, talk of going back to maybe that identity piece, trying to find okay. out who you are. Mm -hmm. um, that, that can be it. Uh, maybe there's just a sexual appetite that is just raging and the person hasn't determine boundaries or yeah. uh, an, a, a, an awareness of a need to manage that. Mm -hmm. um, so the the causes of it, of that phase um, are several and plenteous, but, you know, but it's not a one size fits all kind of situation. I love that. A lot like other things aren't a one size fits all. Um, yeah. Sorry, I have to get a little spicy with them, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, 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 preacher. Um, yeah, but... yeah. <laughs> But when we talk about this, right, like one of the things that was brought up on the Clubhouse conversation um, was like, do we need this in order to become good at sex as women um, or men? But like, do we need to go through this whole phase in order to become better in the bedroom so that we can learn to please our partners later? Because oftentimes men um, will paint this narrative or put out this um, rhetoric of, you know, I don't want the girl who's a virgin because she's not going to know what to do with this. Or, you know, I want the woman who has experience, but then we also hear this notion of, we don't want too much mileage. So like, <laughs> do we need to go through this in order to become good at sex? I wanna hear your take on that. Yeah, good question. And my emphatic and very resolute question is no, no, it's not necessary. Um, quantity um, never is necessarily equal to qu quality. Say that one more, uh, quantity, one more time. Quality, <laughs> quality does not equal qual quantity. Does not equal quality. Right. Quantity has a it plays a role in learning quality, but it, it but it is not equivalent to. Yep. 
And that means that just because you have repetitions or just because you have multiple partners doesn't mean that you're going to become a sexual aficionado or a sexual um, a, a sexual uh, authority. Yep. It doesn't mean that you're going to become competent in it. Um, I know people who have uh, a lot of sex. I work with sex addicts professionally. It's one of my areas of specialty. Mm -hmm. And many sex addicts have a lot of sex with uh, prostitutes, with multiple partners, uh, you name it. So the quantity is there, the reps are there, but in terms of qualitative sex, healthy sex, yep. sex that is fulfilling, that is gratifying, I mean, you'd be surprised. Maybe you wouldn't be with sex addicts, but you, but the normal person would be surprised that at, at how incompetent they are in the bedroom. So, sex is uh, the quality of sex is a journey that has to be explored through two people who uh, ideally married people um, by God's standard, um, people who uh, are in a commitment, just like yourself, like you mentioned earlier. All right, we're not doing nothing else without a commitment. Yep. And by, by that, it sounds like, I mean, you're married, of course, so mm -hmm. a marital commitment is, is the ideal. Um, but when those two people have that safety, that security, and, and then they can explore and experiment and learn their sexual chemistry, that's where the quality of sexual competency is developed and cultivated. Yeah. It's not necessarily through the repetitions of, of partners or a stage of promiscuity, um, kind of a trial and error situation. I don't subscribe to it nor do I endorse it. Okay, so you just touched on something that I can't, for my listeners, from audience, I can't um, wait to talk about. I kind of need to go into it right now. You just touched yeah. on marriage, which is a very sensitive topic, especially within the spiritual community because um, of the rhetoric of, or even the scripture that says, you know, you need to be married in order to have sex. I was not a virgin with my husband um, and I made love. However, I did make it a committed relationship, right? Um, but a lot of people don't even require the commitment, which is something that I require in my program is like, we don't do it without a commitment. You may not have yeah. to have a ring on it, but at least let, like, let us get to the commitment. Um, how do you, let's, let's talk a little bit about this role that religion plays, because although the Bible does say, you know, that you should be uh, married, the truth of the matter is we become a culture that doesn't subscribe to that. And then there's this like guilt and this weight on us every time we do lay with someone. I kind of want to hear your take on that in, you know, that the direction that we've been led versus where we're going. Yeah, yeah. So um, when you say the direction that we've been led mm -hmm. versus where we're going, can you speak a little bit more to that specifically? I okay. want to launch off of that. Okay, let me elaborate. Growing up, I was told God is watching everything that I do. So if I have sex before marriage, I am sinning. OK, <laughs> so I did. How I would did wait till I was 21. I waited a very long time before I lost my virginity. However, when I did do it, there was still this voice in my mind that was saying like, "Ooh, but I know this isn't what the Lord wanted. However, I'm not about to wait till I'm married because who knows when that's going to be. I still want to have my sexual exploration, which I did embark on. Right. So I like to speak to my audience and tell them my personal experience so that they don't sure. feel a certain way. I'm not talking about them. I'm like, I always use me as a guinea pig when it comes to even my clients. So, so one thing I know is that like, okay, I didn't necessarily do what the word said. However, I do believe what the word says. I do believe in this truth. I just didn't yeah. abide by that. Right. Yeah. And so where yeah. I think the culture is going is in a place of more promiscuity being um, acceptable, right? Us not having boundaries when it comes, or even requirements when it comes to who we lay with and who we give our body to. Where before I feel like in my youth um, and in my parents' generations and generations before that, it was more about like, no, we need to be married. And now I feel like it's more like, we just need to exchange contact information. Right, right, absolutely. I see what, you, I see what you're saying exactly. And- um, uh, such a necessary uh, place to park. Um, where we have been led versus where we are going, I think is the distinction to make that explains the, 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 the rudiments, the spiritual rudiments of the faith in the Bible, and then what pop culture is doing today. That is the great dichotomy. It's a great divide. Mm -hmm. um, I think what you mentioned about, um, for instance, you know, scripture that, that tells us to flee fornication, sex is for marriage, et cetera, et cetera. Those scripture, scripture is the standard of God. Scripture is the, the, the benchmark. Bar, it's like the, it's the gold the bar. medal. Okay. 
goal. It's the ideal. Um, and without an ideal, without a bar, without a standard, mm-hmm. then we all would be wandering, wandering aimlessly. We have nothing to attain to. Yeah. We all, there is, if there is no law that says statutory rape occurs at 17 and under, mm-hmm. that's not a standard. If we don't have that moral standard there, yeah. then yeah. now, then, then people, then, then people start, you know, getting sexual partners that are younger than 16, 15. Now where's the standard? We have sure. no standard. Yeah. I see your so, with, so without, you know, then w- w- at what point does it become wrong? Right. But at, at six, five. Yeah. You know, we need, we need a standard. Okay. All of us need a standard. Yeah. Without a guideline, without a, without a bar, then mankind does whatever he or she wants. So scripture is not the problem. The preaching, the preaching of the scripture is not the problem. It's God's standard. Now, scripture also says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Mm-hmm. That we all have fallen short of God's zenith or his pinnacle, his glory, his standard. We all have fallen short of that. And that's why we need Christ, right? Yeah. So, so, it, so that's, he, he's the great conduit. He's the great reconciliation tool for us to begin to move toward the standard of God. But God's standard, God's perfect. He's holy yeah. and his standard's not budging. All right, now that we've established that, society has gotten more comfortable with, we've moved away from the the stress of trying to meet spiritual standards. Yeah, facts. <laughs> That's so true. Yes, it was stressful. Yeah, we, it's stressful. <laughs> It's tough. It's a challenge to get your flesh in, under subjection to try to meet God's criteria. And it's much more easy, fun, painless, and absolutely satisfying to the flesh mm-hmm. to throw the Bible away, throw those standards away and say, hey, I'm going to explore me. I'm going to be who I want to be. So if I am, you know, if I want to be sexually prom- promiscuous, I'm going to say, hey, this is who I am. I'm fluid. I'm sexually fluid and I'll be with whoever I want to be with. And I will, and you better not judge me. Um, or it's, <laughs> We don't know, want that. I, That's so true. We're like, but we don't want your opinion on it. Like, I don't want to hear your thoughts. Just let me do my thing. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you, don't, you better not judge me. So now judgment is relegated to, to, to bringing me to consciousness about what I'm doing wrong. Yes. That's what judgment is relevant to. Yes. However, what what people don't understand is judgment is a decision. It's a ruling. Mm-hmm. So if I say, hey, you having a promiscuous stage, that's good, girl. Go, go for it. That's a good mm-hmm. thing. That is a judgment in and of itself because I'm calling it good. Yeah. I just deemed it good. That's judgment. But what about but, acceptance? But if though? I, what's that? Isn't that, isn't that acceptance though? Can't someone accept you without judgment or no? Is that not possible? So, so, so acceptance is just, is, acceptance is to not, is to not rule on it one way or another. Okay. And acceptance is just, I'm going to, I'm going to accept you as a person. Mm-hmm. Acceptance is, I'm just going to have a relationship with you. Yeah. But, uh, you, but, but when it comes to behaviors, when we say, when we give our opinion one way or another, that's when we make a judgment. So what judgment has ha- the, the the judgment has become like the scarlet letter in the negative sense in that when people say you don't do this you shouldn't do this then you're judging mm-hmm. but when you say you should do it which is also a judgment we don't call that judgment we take the judgment label off and call that support <laughs> you accept me. yeah we do <laughs> okay it supports me and you're judging me. When the truth is to say good or bad, either way is a judgment. Right. So, so, so we're blackballing judgment. So I think the society, we do that so that we can push down our consciousness about trying to meet God's standards and enjoy a life of really licentiousness, doing whatever we want to do, taking full executive privilege to take our lives, to govern ourselves the way we want to, to satisfy, to be uh, indulgent mm-hmm. and scratch our itches to sow our royal oats without the consciousness of having been brought to justice on that, which is what judgment is. Mm-hmm. It's being brought to justice. We do, when somebody steals our car, we do want them to be judged. 
But when, <laughs> we, but when we steal from God or we do something against God, we do not want to be judged. We want forgiveness. We want uh, to be absolved. <laughs> <laughs> we, we want you to ignore it. Ignore it. Don't, don't, don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. So that's what that's what this is. So this so this this society has become much more again licentious, much more um, rogue, much more uh, unconscious of God. And I think people do that to kind of soothe from the stress of having to meet the standard. Like you mentioned, when you, when you had sex outside of marriage, it was like, oh, this isn't right. This isn't, this isn't what God wants. People don't want to feel like that. They right. don't want to think like that. Right. They want to do it without even thinking about that. So what they've done is they've closed the Bible, closed the standards and say, hey, I'm sexually fluid. And you know, this, this, this society that we're in now gives us a voice and gives us acceptance in that realm where no, well, judging people is shamed and supporting people to do whatever they want to do is celebrated. Mm -hmm. And that's the society that we're in. You hit that on the money. That's exactly where we're at. I can't help but, and and mind you, I, I, I love the congregation that I grew up in. So shout out to my uncle Ralph, who was my pastor. Um, but I can't, but I've also experienced um, through my adulthood and growing up and venturing and ex exploring other congregations and churches, right? Um, mm -hmm. Religious practice that does persecute you and does shame you and is extremely hypocritical when it comes to what the pastor has said for you to do or what the church has said for you to do. Um, or what members of, you know, the congregation have said for you to do, and they're not living that lifestyle. And so on behalf of the people who I know have experienced this, I have to bring it up and say, you know, yeah. that we do see a lot of hypocrisy, even in um, a church that I love that I was going to, and the pastor was like stealing, you know, the, the ties and having affairs right. with like women in the church. And does that taint our hearts? Does that affect you know, the way that we take in the word or, you know, our faith, I, I would lie and say that it didn't make me somewhat like question like, well, geez, Louise, if some, the people who I entrusted, you know, who were telling me this word or who were, you know, um, preaching to me this gospel, you know, did that hurt me? And did that affect my perspective? Absolutely. I had to go through my own spiritual journey of like where I am with my faith and my practice um, just to get back to a place of reconnecting, you know, with my God and my relationship, because uh, in my adulthood, I experienced different churches where I was like, felt somewhat felt betrayed by the church. What do you have to say, like, for, for those situations where we're like, I don't want to be persecuted, I don't want to be judged, and especially when there's hypocr hypocrisy going on. Absolutely. That's a very, very um, real thing that's happening, and it has to be spoken to. So I'm happy that you're bringing it up and I'm, I'm completely prepared to lean into this. Let's this, lean this into it. <laughs> yeah, let's, I always say, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Yeah. Um, so I want to look at this on like a continuum. I think okay. we have to look at it on like a continuum. And that is um, in, in, the, in the journey of being a Christian, you have different stages of, of maturation. Okay. When you are a babe in Christ, then, then you need, as a baby, you need your parent to nurture you and to feed you. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you need everything. You need everything. All of your, your you know, the diaper changes, yep. the, the, the food, all right, the blanket, it comes from your parent. And, if, and, and your whole life is in that parent's head, hands. You don't even have a real relationship with God. You, you have a relationship with your parent. Right. Okay. When you mature, you can, in Christ, then you can, you get to know God more mm -hmm. and you need the parent less. You need the right. parent less. Okay. As you mature, any baby that matures grows eventually to need their parent less and less. When you are talking about Christians who are younger in the faith, mm -hmm. um, when the preacher is struggling with something that he is preaching himself, if there is not consistency mm -hmm. because the child is young and all they can see is the parent, yeah. the preacher mm -hmm. can't see God yet completely, mm -hmm. then when they mess up, when the preacher messes up, 
then the, 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 the babe sees, oh, this is hypocritical. This is fake. This I'm disappointed mm -hmm. and I'm hurt mm -hmm. because you are the standard of all that I can see. Yeah. Sometimes with the babe, the only God that they can see is the preacher. Yeah. They can't see God yet. Okay. They just need his messenger. Again, this is a continuum. Right. When you grow in faith, you the preacher becomes less important mm. and God becomes more important. So now when you grow in faith, then you realize that the preacher is actually simply a messenger. Mm. If the preacher lies, but he's preaching, thou shall not lie, mm -hmm. then how, how much does that dis diminish the message of lying being wrong? Lying is still wrong. <laughs> lying is still wrong <laughs> if he's a liar. Right. But the babe can't draw that distinction mm -hmm. and still grab value from the truth of lying is still wrong for me, regardless of who's doing it. So the babe, because they're weaker in the faith, they're going to be impacted by the failure in the preacher's life because they can't see God independently themselves yet. Mm. So the hypocrisy, apparently, the apparent hypocrisy, or what just may not even be hypocrisy, it just may be a failure because yeah. he happens to be human too. Um, it, it That failure, that, that babe takes personally and says, oh my God, this is, you know, this impacted me. How could you? It's a great betrayal. You're supposed to be the man of God. You're supposed to be the standard. What they're really saying without saying it is you're supposed to be God. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they're saying we're without actually saying high. words. Oh, we're holding you too high. Yeah. I'll hold you too high. They're not creating room for his humanity while they'll tell him, oh yeah, everybody's human. The preacher does not get to be human. So but when he, when you are mature, when you mature on the continuum, now you are able to distinguish, okay, if this person has some inconsistencies in their life, I'm just going to pray for them and let God work on that preacher. He's still anointed. Mm -hmm. She's still anointed. It can still do what they do. They're still human. They have their own growth journey, but that doesn't take away from the gift that God has given them to mm -hmm. the ability to speak into my life yeah. and give me truth for me to be challenged by the truth because the truth of God is objective. The truth of God is immaterial to who's doing it or not doing it. We as preachers just happen to be the ones that are on the front line administering the message. Yep. And people, people have, people are very, very visual. People are very, very optical. Yep. So if you get a jar of Welch's grape jelly, but the jar on the outside looks really dusty. <laughs> what are you going to do when there's other jars around? What are you going to do? Oh, I'm reaching for the clean, fresh, nicely branded <laughs> jar. <laughs> exactly. You're going to reach for that nicely branded jar, that clean, fresh one, mm -hmm. even if the expiration dates are, are the same on them. I don't care. It's because, don't care. Yep. Now, check this out the seal of freshness hasn't even been broken on either jar. The content is as good in the dusty jar as it is in the beautiful, pristine, polished, clean jar. Yeah. But we are really responsive yeah. to what we see on the outside. Yep. That is the equivalent of the person who sees the preacher messing up and says, oh, you're a hypocrite. And I'm going to throw away God. I'm going to throw away the <laughs> word because <laughs> you don't look good because you got dust on you. Instead of focusing on the fact that while the outside may be a little dusty, we never eat the jar. We eat the contents in the jar. <laughs> and that's it. So that's I don't know what's in there. No, this is such a great analogy that you're giving, um, especially because you took it from like parenting, right? And our parents are imperfect, raising us. Um, and we see what they're yeah. doing and we're like, but mom and dad, you're not doing what you're telling me to do. So therefore, like, I'm not going to do it when really like the information and that they, what they want for your life is still the best for you um, is just Absolutely. that they're human. And then this also yep. 
aesthetics example that you gave on um, us being visual is something I work through with my clients all the time because of, you know, the, the dating world and it being so visual, we pass up on a lot of good jam or <laughs> jelly um, because yeah. that is delicious, but people won't get past the exterior. And so yeah. I preach all the time to them, like, come on, what is it about his character? What is it about the way that he treats yeah. you, his foundation, who he is as a person versus like that fresh haircut that you were looking for or those specific brand shoes or how tall he is? Like, let's talk about who he is as a man, as a human. And so I love right. the example that you're giving because it relates so well, even to our dating world of being somewhat superficial on this visual yeah. level. So absolutely, amazing. it's the content, Spice. Yeah. It's the content. That's what we have to. I love what you just said. Absolutely, you got it. Amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, so I know, like, I, I got to keep asking you questions because um, my time with you is limited. I know, you, like I said, you got it. You got clients waiting for you too. So I yeah. want to get back to um, talking about the hoe phase, right? Because like this all relates to what you teach, even with sexual addiction. Um, can you yeah. speak a little bit about? Um, the ramifications of going through this phase, some of the good, the bad, the ugly that can happen. Um, I like to think that and I'll speak to, I'll speak to the positive. Okay. Um, I do yeah, yeah. believe that there are some positives in your sexual exploration when you get to mm -hmm. learn more about your body and experience partners um, and learning what you like, what you don't like. It's just like salsa dancing. Different men will lead you differently. You'll have different um, experiences. Um, but that's in the notion that you're capable of getting out of the hoe phase, that you're capable of recovering from the hoe phase, right? Um, there are a lot of things that happen negative, the ugly, when going through that phase. Can you speak to some of the mental, physical, and spiritual things that happen from a negative standpoint going through this phase? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, and I appreciate you just taking the time to 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 highlight that there are some, some natural, uh, what we would call uh, immediate conceptual benefits yeah. where you, you do learn, you do learn about your body. You do learn about, um, and I'm, I'm saying this because I don't want people to hear a bias lean. I want right. to be objective. Right. I want to be comprehensive. So I'm happy that you're doing it. But I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm helping you out. <laughs> um, yeah, I appreciate it. I see you. I see you. So um, it's, uh, it is, you know, you when you have sexual experiences, just like when you have experiences in anything, yeah. uh, you taste different restaurants, you taste different types of food, you know, your palate is cultured. You do get developed, you, you get you get perspective that you didn't have. Yep. Um, but uh, I want to be careful with even that because all perspective is not good perspective. Mm -hmm. And and there are some things that and we are so addicted to knowledge in this society. We are so addicted yeah. to just learning and knowing. And yeah. I want to know everything. I want to know. Yeah. And the truth is, there is a such thing as knowing too much. Mm. You can you can see things that you that you never were supposed to see. Mm. Um, I work in trauma. Um, it's with sex addicts, partners who have been traumatized mm. by their husbands or wives' sex addiction. Oh wow! And when when they when they uncover Maybe they discover, you know, a, a, a phone, um, uh, you know, a text message thread. Mm -hmm. I had a client who he, um, his wife was cheating. He was a white guy and his wife was cheating on him with a black man. And she, he, and he was in, he started going through the messages and going through the phone and he saw pictures of the, the, the affair partner's genitalia. Oh, wow. And when he saw that, he said, huh. <laughs> And he, and, and he, and he, and he lost control. Yeah, I'm sure. And, 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 he, and he, and he saw, he saw, he saw a difference mm -hmm. and that, that yeah. knowledge seared his conscience. Yep. I can see that. It seared his conscience. He was never able to recover from the fact that he discovered that his wife is what we call in, 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 in sex addiction and pornography, uh, a pornography addiction, a size queen. He had no idea that that was what she was doing and that's what she was satisfied by. And that was her capacity. And he had no idea that that was her appetite. And he looked with, within himself and he became completely inferior. Mm. And no matter what she said, she, he, she saw all kinds, he saw all kinds of text messages, uh, exchanges, verbal, 
a, gra a gratification and lauding and appreciation of this other partner's anatomy. Yeah. And and sh and he saw things that she said uh, against her own husband. Mm. And he was just his. I mean, you can imagine the trauma. Heartbreaking. I'm sure. It is. It is absolutely destructive. Yeah. So, but you couldn't tell him in a moment of curiosity mm -hmm. that he wasn't supposed to go and looking for that. Yeah. You couldn't tell him. Absolutely. Because no, he has to. He has to <laughs> Curiosity. I wanna, I wanna so he's snooping through the phone and he, he learned something that he, he wished he had never learned. Yeah. And so there is a such thing as learning too much. So even in those experiences where people experiment and there's some level of relative benefit to, okay, okay, I, I know I got my palate. I know what I like. And even in that, you can, the some of the danger in that is you could meet a great guy or meet a great girl. Yeah. And if they don't have the anatomy that you're used to mm -hmm. or certain, you know, a feel, a touch or that you're used to, the trade-off in that value, in that benefit that you've had, the trade-off is you now could be inclined to throw the baby out with the bathwater yep. because your, your appetite, your palate has been too diversified. And now, and, and that, that that's where the danger is. So now here is where, here's the rationale in, Hey, God says, wait till you're, wait till you're married mm -hmm. because he's not trying to spoil your party. He's not trying to, you know, you know, rain on your parade and, you know, be a party pooper. He's trying to protect you from perspective that could hurt you otherwise, but that when you get in the confines of a committed relationship, you now don't know left from right. This is the only the measuring uh, standard that you have is what you experience. Yeah. And now you can experience sex purely. Now you can experience sex without the consciousness of comparison. Now you can, you don't have to fight hard to fight off fantasies about other satisfactory experiences yeah. while you're in the moment with your spouse. You don't have to fight those thoughts or retreat to those thoughts. Right. You don't have to go there when you're, when you're trying to have a, a moment because this is your only baseline. This is your only frame of reference. So I think, I think I'm kind of killing two birds with one stone yeah. in that, in that, you know, there are some, what, what society would call uh, benefits. But if you study those benefits more closely, I think you'll find that there's a very significant trade-off, even in those perceived benefits. And, and I don't know anybody who, who has, who has waited till marriage and regretted it mm. when they, when they, when they actually do it God's way. Um, I know many people who have regretted it that they didn't wait to marriage and then they, and then now <laughs> they fight. And now they fight these demons. They're still desiring their old boyfriend, their right. old girlfriend, high school sweetheart. There's this person put it down this way or that person, my husband or my wife, you know, you got to battle with all of that. Yeah. So I think um, now you can recover from that. There is a way to recover from that. There's a way to purify yourself. Talk but the journey that. is, yeah, talk about that. Yeah. Because like, what about the person who, I'm not going to lie, I had partners before my husband, right? So um, thank God I'm blessed that he is blessed. <laughs> but there's people who who aren't necessarily in relationships where they may be satisfied right to you know the woman the, the example that you gave how would after experiencing other partners or you know that variety you know that gave you that spice of life how now do you go back to appreciating and loving something that may not be as sexually satisfying for you if you know their partner isn't well endowed or able to put it down you know, can you, should you still stay in that relationship if you're not satisfied and can you survive that relationship when you've experienced, you know, somewhat better? What is your advice around that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, my, my recommendation first and foremost would be to sterilize and purify the relationship. And that is uh, purify the sexual relationship as well. Uh, my recommendation would be to stop having sex immediately. With your partner? So that with your part, with your, with your, with, if you're not married, mm -hmm. then yes. If you are married, then maybe even take a break, mm -hmm. maybe a break. I, I prescribe sexual uh, intermissions for my clients, depending on what's going, who are married, yeah. depending on what's going on in their marriage. Maybe they're desensitized. Maybe they're, you know, looking for ways to kind of spice up 
the sexual dynamics. Mm -hmm. Maybe they become a little bit bored. Uh, maybe, um, maybe, you know, there's an emotional trauma or something mm -hmm. like that going on. So sometimes I will write the, the prescription and say, hey, stop having sex. Yeah. Or give it a week, give it two weeks. Let's do us a, a month of sexual abstinence where we just take a minute to kind of like, it's kind of like spicy. It's kind of like going into a perfume shop mm -hmm. uh, where when you, you go in and you smell this fragrance and you're like, mm, that smells terrific. Right. What else you got? And you smell this. Mm, that smells great. Wow. And then you keep smelling. And then what happens after a while <laughs> is what? Your olfactory yeah. senses, they begin to diminish. You're not able to smell as honestly yeah. as like, your nose <laughs> is capable of. Your nose is capable of smelling more right. honestly and accurately, but your but your olfactory palate has been so conflicted with all of these different sensate dynamics that you need you need a break. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They give you coffee beans, right? To do what? Uh, to neutralize, yeah. To new, to reset your palate so that you can smell again to your potential, mm. so that you can smell again to your capacity because you've had too much exposure. And even the clerk at the perfume office understands yeah. that you need a break when you're smelling too much, <laughs> all right? You, right. Don't, you, don't need, you don't need a PhD to know that, okay? Yeah. You don't need an MD to know that. So. It's so I think I think if, if you're if you if you're trying to recalibrate and kind of try to really get an honest read on whether or not you can be sexually fulfilled in this relationship, my prescription would be to back away from sex, mm -hmm. back away from it, not for the rest of your life. Yeah. All right. Hey, I know a week or a week or two may feel like the rest of your life. It may feel like <laughs> They're going to be like, oh, I got a week. <laughs> Oh my God, I can't do it. I'm weak. So, that, so, so they may feel like that, but it's not. It's, 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 a, it's an engineered intentional abstinence period where, again, if you're not married, I would recommend completely stopping it all together and making that making and resuming in the middle, in the, uh, in the confines of a committed marriage. Um, but if you are married and you're, and you're battling some of those thoughts, you're battling some of those experiences, I would say just back away for a moment and, and, and re-educate each other about sex mm -hmm. and talk about sex, learn about sex, read about sex, and then get back into the bedroom at an agreed upon time and then start experiencing the new version, the 2.0 version yeah. of the relation of the sexual relationship. Uh, because comparison is the cancer to Ooh. sex, to relationships, it's the cancer. Number one, people need to understand size is not everything. Correct. Correct. It it does play a role. Let me be honest about that. It does play a role. <laughs> okay. It does play a role. It does play it. But I can't tell you how many women I've talked to who have had experiences with men who are well endowed and be like, look, overrated. Yep. Uh, it, no, he didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. You know what to do with it, or it hurt, or it was uncomfortable, you know, different things like that. So size is not king. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you, you, there are many more elements and metrics that go into a healthy sexual experience. Communication. You would be surprised at how much communication during sex can amplify the sexual encounter. Just so what I, one of the things that I share with my clients, my couples is communicate before, during, and after sex so that there's competency yeah. in the sexual relationship. I like that. Um, if, spicy if we have right good, <laughs> what's that? That was a spicy tip right there. I like that. <laughs> That's a spicy tip. Yeah, absolutely. Communicate, talk before, during, and after the sexual relationship, because if you're not communicating, then what's happening? Well, it's kind of like, it's kind of like somebody, it's kind of hit or miss. Yeah. It's trial and error. I might get it right. I might not. But it's also kind of like a like a like a musician who mm -hmm. can play by ear versus one who can read music. Mm -hmm. When you can when you play by ear, you may be gifted. You may be amazing. But that's not the same 
as as reading music yep. because reading music is when you have music down to a science mm. when you have a command of it see mm. people who have good chemistry just may have good chemistry but right. if they don't have a command of it then they can't control it i'm loving this command yes they ha- they can't control it it's hey you caught me on a good day we were having good <laughs> we had a good time it just happened to work. You were feeling good. I was feeling good, but we don't understand the, the chemistry. Yeah. But when you get it down to a science, when you communicate, you'll understand that you, you, when I touch her here, she responds here because this makes her feel safe. Mm-hmm. Mm, okay. Now I can touch you here. I can locate my hand here. I can, you know, I can do X, Y, and Z dynamics in the sexual experience because not from a place of intelligence. Yeah from a place of familiarity, from a place of, I know how to read music. Right. I'm commanding your body. I'm controlling, I'm in the driver's seat. So everything that we do in our sexual chemistry experience is intentional. Mm -hmm. I'm putting in intentional elements of sulfur and zinc of copper and of, all right, these are, this is the touch. This is the foreplay. This is the, the, the finessing and the caressing. All of this is scientifically calculated. So when your body yields an orgasm, it's going according to plan. Right. That's intelligence. That's sobriety. And you can learn that. You can learn that. Um, if you're, if, if you can learn that in the course of the relationship, if you communicate, if you're constantly talking and if the sexual relationship is boring, then you might want to take a step back, stop having sex so that you can have that coffee bean season. And when you smell again, you smell honestly. But guess what? When you come back to the table, you now have those chemistry elements defined because you've done your homework. Mm. You've spent more time talking about sex so that you both now have a competency to contribute right. to the sexual experience. And now we'll get a read on whether or not this can be fulfilling. And more times than not, it can be. Oh, I'm sure. Because at this point, I already know my audience is listening and they're telling me, I feel, I feel it in my soul. They want me to ask, I don't see a ring on your finger. Why are we not in a relationship or are we? Because you sound like too educated, too, you know, like in, in one inspiring and able to articulate like what, why are we not in a relationship right now? Or are we? <laughs> well, I'll say I'll, I'll, I'll answer it this way. Uh, I'll answer it from the place of marriage. Okay. Uh, because I'm a, I'm a marriage specialist. I'm a marriage counselor. Okay. A lot of people say, you know, how are you a marriage counselor and you're not married? You know, what's going on? You know, what's 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 the how do you reconcile? I'm like the well, matchmaker in me wants to start sending you some women right away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have them lined up after this, okay? After hearing you speak, they're like, wait, I think that's my husband. Watch. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll say this: marriage is marriage is a very, very serious commitment, mm-hmm. and um, I work with a lot of people who don't understand the commitment of marriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I work with a lot of people who don't understand the commitment of relationship, much right. less to a less extent marriage. Um, and so, um, it, it, let's just say finding finding a person who uh, who understands that or who is prepared to do the work to understand that mm-hmm. is not exactly growing on trees quite it's not growing on trees so um so and then and then you know my, my my profile is um it's complicated i'm 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 not only a psychotherapist but i'm also a pastor yeah so you know it's um you got a lead- whole package yeah it's it's a lot to carry and um, you know, <laughs> I've, I've had experiences in times past where, you know, it, it looks good on the outside and people, you know, they want to sign up, but when they, they get in bed with this thing and it's like, woo, this is way too much. I yeah. can't really handle this. Oh, you're it's more than gold what standard, I, right. They got to reach that gold standard, the bar to be with you. Okay. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that, but I would say that it's, you know, it's, um, um, I, I, I if, if relationship can't be done healthy. Um, then, then I, then I don't want it. Hmm. And I, and I, I only, I have the only relationships that I have close to me in my life, uh, of any variety, business, the friendships, familial, platonic, you name it. They're all intentional and healthy relationships. Okay. So when it comes to a wife that has to, that candidate has to be a healthy 
healthy choice. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not, it's not an easy onboarding process, I guess. Okay. I will like, I received that. And I'm also going to challenge you, um, with Please. some, some great variety and options of women who I believe are capable of meeting your gold standard. Um, <laughs> Uh, that I have some, I have, I have confidence. Okay. I'm good. I'm really good at what I do. Um, so based on like the energy that I feel from you, um, there are some people who I already have in mind that don't be surprised also too, if people are in my comments, like sign me up for the Clifford program. Um, <laughs> and then I also have some amazing clients too, that have been through the spicy life program that would be mentally and spiritually prepared for you. Um, so I'm going to challenge you on this. So like when you sign up, when you work with me, okay. Um, I, I can't help but to put you. I can't help you on the show. I can't help but to put you in the hot seat. Um, <laughs> so I love everything that you're sharing with me, though. And I know, um, really quick, I wanted to ask you if you could just speak on really quick um, the difference between um, this whole standard and what or this whole phase and why it's acceptable for um, uh, men to be sexually explorative and society has accepted that and not so much women. Can you just give us a little bit on like this hypocrisy, even in that, once again, I'm going to use this word hypocrisy yep, and why yep. they get to go through it and we don't. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I will speak to that. And first I, I need to start off by saying uh, it is a double standard. Thank you. It is, it is a double standard. It is a double standard uh, in society. Um, and um, I'm going to actually make a case for why um, I understand the double standard okay. and that all, all double standards are not completely altogether bad. I'll explain this. Um, so the analogy that I like to use is, um, yeah. is two, two buildings. Okay. Two buildings. You have a football stadium and then you have a church. Football stadium. You have a football stadium and a church. Okay. okay. They're both buildings. Correct. Um, as people, we need both of those buildings to fulfill different needs in our lives. We need a football stadium for entertainment. Okay. And so in the football stadium, in entertainment, we shout. What are we doing? What's the culture in a football stadium? We shout. We're shouting. We're talking smack. We're watching the game. Yeah. We're riled up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we're riled up. We're, we're raucous. Exactly. There's, and that's appropriate for a football stadium. You have a building, a church building. Okay. What's the culture in a church building? We're listening to the sermon. Um, when it's time for praise and worship, we're singing and dancing and we get loud. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So you got, you got time, you got time, but you have, you have, you have guidelines, you have different rules of engagement yeah. in a church. Um, it's not necessarily, depending on the kind of church you go to, the place to be jumping up and down like you're in a football stadium. Correct. Um, and we're not starting fights with the Bibles there. <laughs> well, some churches, but most are. <laughs> exactly. exactly. At least not ideally, right? <laughs> All right. These are two buildings. Um, which building is better? Better? As far as the structure? Uh, neither are better. Exactly. Thank you for answering the trick question accurately. Okay. Neither are bad. They're not to be compared. Okay. So then if neither are more or less valuable, if neither are better, because we need a football stadium to have a good time and yeah. we need a church to connect to God. Right. If neither are better, then why do we behave differently in them? Because we're honoring different rules and regulations that have been put in place or different um, cultures that have been accepted or guidelines that are told that are unacceptable. Exactly. And acceptable to what end though, so that we optimize our experience in both arenas. Okay. I see where so you're how, going. What is this? How does this relate? You see where I'm headed? Yeah. With relationships. I th yeah. I think, I think in, in, in this analogy, spicy men, for whatever reasons are, football stadiums. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are rougher. Our hands are generally bigger and stronger. Yeah. We have more muscles. Yeah. We have bass in our voice. We have masculine traits. Mm -hmm. We have, I can, you can yell to your son, hey, sit down and shut up and, and behave. And that might get a response out of them. But when daddy yells, hey, sit down and shut up. Mm -hmm. It's a whole different situation. Right. There's a, who's, who's better? 
neither are better. Right. Neither. It's just that your voice has a delicacy. Your voice has a different role in the parental objective. Right. The father has an authoritative position in that he gets, he can speak to the, to the barrel of the son Mm -hmm. in a deeper way. And, and because there's identity in the father, yeah. it doesn't mean that the mother's role is diminished. You just play different roles because yeah. guess what? When he, when he falls and scrapes his leg and has a boo-boo, he's probably not going to run to daddy to hold him. <laughs> he's coming up. We're more nervous. He's better. Yeah. More nervous. So I think, I think it is a double standard in that men, the society accepts for whatever reasons, the, the behaviors of men, because we have different skill sets, mm-hmm. we have different texture, we yeah. have different, men are football stadiums. Yeah. And women are beautiful cathedrals. You are beautiful cathedrals. Okay. I'm a cathedral. It's guy. not a, yes, you are. A cathedral. <laughs> yes, you are. You are a cathedral and, and, and you don't compete with a stadium. Correct. There's just different rules of engagement because the, the, the football stadium is, is, is more brute. It's more brash. It's more brittle. It's more raw. And a cathedral is more precious. It is more tender. It is more delicate. It is more hollowed. It is more sacred. Mm. There's a sacredness to the woman. There's a sacredness to the woman in terms of being entered into Mm-hmm. sexually mm-hmm. and she receives she lays on her back and she submits and she receives action there's a delicacy in that that does not exist with the man yeah the man delivers we plant seed women receive seed there's an active and there's a passive there's an aggressive and there's a a a, 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 a submissive mm-hmm. there is a a, a, there is a, 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 a strength and there is a, 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 a frailness, not a weakness, but, yep. a, but, a, a, but a fragility. A softness. Mm-hmm. A softness. Uh, and this is precious. Yeah. And this is also valuable, but they don't value the same. Yeah. So I think this is the, this is a double standard. <laughs> but you're like, but it's, it's a double standard. <laughs> But, but it's not apples to apples. Right. It is a double standard, but it's not apples to apples. I think, and I think women who who get frustrated at the double standard and who want equality in that, I think they fail to realize the value of just how precious they are, how much of a how much value a cathedral is. Yeah. Against, against, not more than, but against opposite of a football stadium. Yeah. And I think, I don't know how much sense that makes. No, it does. I love, I love all of the analogies that you've been giving um, this entire episode. It, I think, um, puts our minds and hearts a little bit more at peace, right? You're giving us um, a great perspective and people get to decide like, okay, that sits with me. Um, I, I received that. Or some people may, may, may not be in a place where they can hear that. I hear you though. Um, and I yeah. appreciate it. And I love your perspective you have to um, let everybody know if they want more of Clifford. Um, how can they schedule an appointment? Can they, what website, um, social, where can they learn more about you and receive you more? Absolutely. You can follow me on all social media fl- platforms, particularly Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook at Clifford J. Clark, mm-hmm. C L I F F O R D J C L A R K, no E. You can also find me um, on my website at transparent-counseling.com, uh, transparent-counseling.com. I'm, I'm booked to capacity right now, so there is a waiting list um, to, to, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. <laughs> it yes, is, a, it is. <laughs> it's a good problem to have, good problem to have. but um, yeah, but, uh, but there is a waiting list. And so uh, just give us a call and I'll get you in as soon as I can, if you're interested in, uh, in a session. And then of course, um, you can uh, watch my sermons, preaching or teaching, um, exhibitions at conquerorschurch.org. You can also follow the at Conquerors Church Facebook page. All that stuff is on my social media, so it won't be hard to find. And you can see me teaching and preaching on intermittent Wednesdays and Friday, uh, Sundays. I love that. And I'm going to try to get you into some more clubhouses too. And I have to bring you back on the Spicy Life podcast as well. 
Um, and I'll be reaching out to you about um, some matches that I'm trying to make for you. Uh, <laughs> I can't help myself, you guys. But you can always play with my Twitter or stroke my Instagram at Spicy Mati. Make sure you go to thespicylife.com, click and subscribe, download this episode, share it with a friend that you know needs to hear it. Um, and make sure that you pass this episode along, tune in every week for a new episode. And there you guys have it. You have just been spiced. The Spicy Life.